chilling tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Good evening, listener. You're listening to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. On tonight's edition, we invite you to leave behind your safe reality and descend with us into the frightening depths of the most terrifying imaginations with an audio adaptation of frightening fiction about bungled busts. I'm your host, Steve Taylor, and tonight... And every other Monday night, I'll be your guide as we traverse the dimly lit corridors of your darkest dreams. Joining us tonight to help bring to life the frightening fiction of R.K. Combrink are voice actors Jonathan West, Eric Peabody, Nick Goroff, Rissa Montanez, Kevin Barberi, and myself, Steve Taylor. Now, get your ticket ready. Take your seat in our theater of the minds and brace yourself. It's time to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Our tale this evening is written by R.K. Combrink and is performed by Jonathan West, myself, Steve Taylor, Eric Peabody, Nick Goroff, Rissa Montanez, and Kevin Barberi. Now, without further ado, I present to you Trailer Trash. I'm not 100% convinced of this, Alex. Need you to know that right now. Sergeant Howard glanced back and forth between the two file folders open on the desk in front of him. I know, Don, I know. But look, these two are desperate to stay on the street. They'll do anything we want. Alex tapped the photo paper clipped to the folder on the left. This guy especially. He'd suck his own dad's dick to stay out of jail just so he could get his medicine. Yeah, and you're not gonna be armed. You're gonna be in a car with this guy, this desperate guy as you call him, and his trick girlfriend, driving out into the middle of East buttfuck nowhere with a bug in your ear and no gun. Even if they don't decide to kill you and leave your body in the woods, even if they actually take you to see this Grayson guy, now you're in the lion's den and I can't back you up. Howard shook his head, doubt written across every crag and crevice of his weathered face. I don't feel good about this. Alex smiled. The sergeant was fiercely protective of his team. He worried over them like a mama bear over her cubs. He even looked a bit like a bear, with his fuzzy chestnut hair, bristling beard, and beer barrel frame. He would bluster and grouse about this surveillance operation and try, through disapproving scowls and gloomy pronouncements, to discourage Alex from going out on it. Alex knew, though, that ultimately, he would have his way, and Howard would let him go. The Meth Suppression Task Force had been chasing rumors of Isaiah Grayson all over Indiana for months. Lately, it hadn't even been rumors, but more like the ghosts of rumors. Then, Alex had stumbled on two brain-fried tweakers trying to score behind a dipshit little bar in a dipshit little town called West Harrison, right on the Ohio border. 
It was these two dead-eyed, slack-jawed freaks that were going to serve him Grayson on a platter. The ISP wanted this bust. Alex really wanted this bust. And his division needed it. Taxpayers wanted to see all the high-tech gadgets and helicopters and guns they were paying for got put to good use now and again. Howard would not say whether he could provide backup or not. I know, but look, that's the beauty of this plan. Monty and Tanya don't know shit from Shakespeare. They don't know that there isn't any backup following along behind us, and I'm damn sure going to tell them that there is. Alex tapped at his temple emphatically. They're too dumb not to believe whatever I tell them. There's no way they're going to throw me over. Then at Grayson's, when they pat me down and don't find a gun, they're not going to worry. He leaned back in his chair with a confident chuckle. I'm not even the one doing the buying. It's still Mondi and Tanya making the deal. I'm just along for the ride. The sergeant looked doubtful. Yeah, but what if I find you bug? They're going to be looking for a wire strapped to my chest, not a tiny mic and an earring. This isn't a cartel we're dealing with here, just some crispy chicken rednecks in a trailer. They don't even know this shit exists. Alex grinned broadly. The fish was almost in the net. Sergeant Howard sighed. And you aren't worried that your, uh, informants might accidentally fuck up, get twitchy, and end up getting all of you killed? That ever occurred to you? Yeah, it's occurred to me. Alex shrugged. What can you do? It's the job, right? The job is not running willy-nilly into harm's way without weapons or backup. But sometimes it is. Sometimes it's gotta be. Alex stood from the hard plastic chair and paced around Howard's office, agitated. Look, this guy moves around. We never know where he's gonna be, and we don't know where he's been till two weeks after he's left. We have one, one blurry photo and a few shaky eyewitness accounts. This guy's harder to find than goddamn Bigfoot, but now we've got a chance to get what we need. He pointed to the door behind him that led out into the communications center. You guys will be listening. You'll be able to get the warrant and I can take you right back there within the fucking hour. He stopped and locked eyes with Howard, no longer grinning, but deadly serious. We need this, Don. You know we do. We get Grayson, shut down his Meals on Wheels operation, grab his money, maybe bust a few other incidentals, and who knows? Maybe we get two or three more guys in the budget for next year to back me up next time I gotta do some shit like this. Alex crossed his arms. He had nothing else to say. Sergeant Howard looked up at him for a long time. Alex knew he saw the truth in his plea, and the futility of trying to stop him. He needed to get out there and hunt down the vermin that spread their disease so gleefully among the people that his team was sworn to protect. That's why Alex had been chosen in the first place. He needed to drag these dealers kicking and screaming to the ground as badly as their buyers needed their poisons. With one final, deep, heavy sigh, the sergeant flipped the folders closed and stacked them on top of one another. He shoved them forward on his desk and nodded. All right, do it. Make sure you remember to turn your mic on. Me and Lucky will be listening back at dispatch. As soon as we get the deal recorded, we'll send it to Judge Marksbury for the one, and then we can call in the locals. Perfect. Thank you, sir. We're going to skewer this son of a bitch. Alex rubbed his hands together. I can't wait to see his face when I come walking up to cuff him. He's going to shit his pants. He grabbed Monty and Tanya's files ready to leave. But before he could get out the door, Howard gave him one last stern warning. First whiff of trouble, any little twitch or quiver in your gut, any hinky little instinct that says something ain't right, anything at all, and you bail. You hear me, trooper? You bail and you get your ass out of there. The sergeant regarded Alex from behind his desk with a mixture of apprehension and pride. Got it? Alex shot him a tight salute. Got it. But he knew that no quiver or twitch was going to get in the way of this score. Want me to roll up the window, bro? Monty looked at Alex in the rearview mirror with merry, bloodshot eyes. 
You getting gold back there? He giggled wildly. Squeezed into the back seat with his legs folded up like a collapsible card table, Alex shook his head. No, man, I'm good. Monty laughed again, a high-pitched gobbling sound. Yeah, you are. You're so good. He slapped his palm against the steering wheel, hooting and snorting. In the passenger seat next to him, Tanya, with her long hair, long legs, and short skirt, took a cigarette from the pack in her purse and lit up. She had been quiet the entire ride except for humming something under her breath off and on. It had been a few minutes after she trailed off into silence that Alex placed it as the zombies' time of the season. It got stuck in his head where it played over and over again as they sailed through the dark Indiana night down a narrow blacktop road. Alex leaned forward as far as he could and tapped Tanya's arm. Her skin was cold. She was wearing a tank top and he could see the jumble of amateurish, badly done tattoos that ran from her bicep to just above her elbow, the most prominent one being a Confederate flag. She turned her head and looked over her shoulder at him. What's up, Popkin? Can I get one of those? Alex pointed to the cigarette between her fingers. She smiled a sad, tight-lipped grin that hid the gaps where some of her teeth had fallen out. Of course you can. She pulled the pack out of her purse, offering it back to Alex, along with a small green lighter. He lit a cigarette and returned the pack and the lighter. Still smiling, she took them back, turned around, and started humming again. Alex sat back and looked out the window, puffing on his smoke. Tall, straight trees hemmed them in on either side of the road, high skeletal branches held aloft. Every so often there would be a telephone pole with a light attached to it that would dazzle his eyes for a moment as they rocketed beneath it. Mostly, though, the darkness swelled, unchallenged except for the headlights of Monty's Regal. They were deep in the boonies and getting deeper. Every so often they passed houses, squat, ramshackle places set far back amongst the trees. But those became fewer and further between. Alex was unfamiliar with this area and felt a tingle of disquiet at the base of his spine. Even though Sergeant Howard and Lucky could hear everything that was happening, they had no way of knowing where he was. The microphone was not a homing device and was too small to be equipped with GPS. If anything were to happen, they might never find him. Squash that shit right now, Alex chided himself as he smoked his cigarette. Everything's gonna be fine. Just remember everything you told Howard and keep your eyes on the goddamn prize. Alex chided himself as he smoked his cigarette. Instead, he thought about how easy it had been to flip Monty and Tanya over on Grayson. He'd been visiting the county sheriff's department, providing some training for low-level undercover work, and had advised them to keep him updated on any meth-related cases that came up. The day before he was to head back to HQ, a young officer named Flynn called him down to the interrogation room. He had two suspects in custody who had been picked up trying to get meth money, by prostituting the woman behind a broken-down local dive bar. Alex had walked into the room and sat down across from them. Monty was a giggling, grizzled Clyde, beating on a hectic rhythm against his thigh with his left hand, scratching madly at his dirty mane of yellow-blonde hair with the right. Tanya was his fever glow bonnie, her jaws locked in that tight-lipped grin as she surveyed the room with impossibly wide eyes. One of them, or both, gave off a strong odor. Not exactly the usual stink of junkies who'd gone a few days without a shower. This was a dirtier smell. A deep smell, wet and fungal. It reminded Alex of earthworms squirming blindly on the sidewalk after a long, hard rain. 
He pushed back a few inches from the desk and addressed his detainees. So, names. Legault, Montgomery Marcus, and Beechwood, Tanya Lynn. Correct? Monty chuckled and glanced sidelong at Tanya. Yep, that's right. I ain't a baby. Tanya nodded. Yes, sir. That's correct. Her voice was soft and flat, barely more than a whisper. She began to hum. And you guys wanted to buy some meth, is that correct? Tanya looked down at the corner of the desk and said nothing, but Monty fixed Alex with a huge, broken-toothed smile. Yes, sir, officer. I'm not trying to lie to the law about it no more. His smile disappeared, and his face became solemn. Yes. We was trying to buy some crank. We was out buying preachers, and we thought that asshole might give Tanya a few bucks for a handy, but instead he goes back and calls your boy who comes along and grabs us. We didn't try no resistance. We come peaceful. We ain't danger to nobody but ourselves. Alex regarded Tanya with sympathetic eyes. Ms. Beechwood, is this true? Without pulling her gaze from the desk, she gave a quick shake of her head in the affirmative. It is. And who are you going to buy it from? Who's your dealer? Monty flapped his hands desperately, appealing to Alex. That's just it. That's just it, officer. We were only so desperate. Because there's a guy in town right now who sells shit that is absolutely off the fucking meters. Travels around and only stops for a week or two. Only comes around every couple of months. He's here now, but we'd already spent my disability check, so we did what we had to do. That shit is A+, plus, believe me. Well worth a handful of jizz. Ain't that right, sugar? He elbowed Tanya beside him and she nodded again. Not your hand, though, right, Moni? Alex favored the stringy tweaker with a withering, sarcastic grin. There were two files on the desk. The same two files Alex would later show Sergeant Howard. They contained Monty and Tanya's priors. He flipped both folders open. Oh, never mind. Listen, you two. We've got us a problem. He held up the folder that held Monty's file. See, you guys have quite extensive records, both of you. Add-on solicitation and attempted possession of an illegal substance. You guys could be looking at some serious jail time here. Monty's jaw had gone slack. His eyes darkened and he began to sputter and chuff. But, but, hold on now. Just hold the fuck on, officer. We're sick people, man. Disabled. Both of us. We can't be in no jail. There's got to be something we can do. He looked over at Tanya. Maybe she can throw a little something-something your way right now and call it even. Alex couldn't believe what he was hearing. Are you seriously trying to fuck yourself over worse here? Bribing an officer with sexual favors? He shook his head. Monty, come on, be smart for once. Work with me here and maybe quit trying to put dicks in your lady's mouth. What is it with you? I don't know. Monty was blubbering now while Tanya continued to hum quietly under her breath. I don't know, officer. It's all we got to give. Try to think along different legal lines, will you? Yes, sir. Yes, I will. Monty swiped at his running nose with his already crusted sleeve and snorted back up snot. What else can we do? Help us. Alex was quiet for a few moments, pretending to think. He knew the question he wanted to ask as soon as Monty had mentioned that their dealer was a guy who traveled around. It was probably a long shot, but maybe this was the guy they'd been looking for. Finally, he spoke. Well, what's the name of this dealer, the one who travels around? Monty looked up at the ceiling, trying to remember, snapping his fingers in the air. Shit. Yeah, it's a... 
Gravitan. No, 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 Grace. It's Grace. He rides around in a trailer. Parks it out near the campgrounds a few miles outside of Bright. Alex's heart began to beat very fast. With deliberate casualness, he shrugged his shoulders. Okay, well, that's a start. He pulled his notepad and a pen from his shirt pocket and flipped it open. You said his name was... Grayson. Don't know his first name. Alex knew it. Isaiah. The Meth Suppression Task Force of the Indiana State Police knew it too. He was wanted across 14 counties. If Alex could pin him down, catch his ass, it would be huge for the Southeast Division. He told Monty and Tanya to sit tight and then tried hard not to run down to the office he was using at the Sheriff's Department. He made a few phone calls and spoke with Sergeant Howard and Sergeant Brixley from Northeast Division. A tentative plan came together to get a warrant. A plan that would require someone who knew where Grayson was going to be. That someone would be escorted by an undercover officer who could then record a drug deal going down. Monty and Tanya were their someones, and Alex had worked undercover many, many times. The snag was that there were no surveillance vans currently available that could be planted nearby to house any backup and no seasoned troopers available to provide support, even if there was a van. Alex would be out there, floating in the deep, black waters, with only the most tenuous and flimsy of lifelines. Talk to your perps first before we get rolling on this. They might not even be okay with this. We don't really have much on them, and half bright public defender couldn't get them out of easily enough. Yeah. Alex had replied with a smile in his voice. But they didn't ask for a lawyer. We read them their rights, and then they just started talking. It's almost too easy. Calls were made to the DA. A plea deal didn't even need to be cut. If Monty and Tanya agreed to participate in the sting, then they'd be released. All charges dropped. Of course, Alex wouldn't present it to them exactly that way. If you do this for us, I think I can get the DA to reduce your charges and maybe get you by with just probation. No jail time. Maybe. This was how Alex had spun it. All Monty and Tanya had to do was drive Alex out to Grayson's and pretend he was their cousin. Then they'd buy meth with an earshot of Alex, using Grayson's name at least once. Then they'd leave and the sergeant would send the surveillance audio to a judge who'd sign a warrant. Monty and Tanya could go free and try and sell themselves for drugs again, and the law could swoop down on Isaiah Grayson, guns blazing. Alex could see commendations in his future. His very near future. Of course, Monty and Tanya agreed. What choice did they really have? They were fed the fiction that there was going to be backup. Tons of it. Following behind at a safe and invisible distance. This backup, they were told, would be heavily armed and monitoring their every move should they develop a case of second thoughts out there in the woods. Now, here they were cruising through the damp midnight chill of late September, the leaves whispering and sighing in the breeze above them. Tanya had gone back to humming time of the season, but Monty had fallen into a morose silence. He twiddled his thumbs restlessly against the steering wheel and glanced at Alex in the rearview mirror every few seconds. After 20 minutes or so, He jagged the car left onto a dirt road that cut suddenly into the woods. Thick darkness swallowed them up as they bounced and humped along the rough lane between the trees. A minute later, Monty finally spoke. Spooky back here. What? Alex had been mentally prepping for the meetup as the cool air from the window washed across his face. I said it's spooky back here gives me the creeps. Monty had reduced their speed considerably. 
Night sounds began to filter in from the shadowy depths beyond the reach of their headlights. Somewhere an owl screeched, and the crickets sang in mournful chorus as the car rolled through. Remember those two guys who disappeared a couple years back out of Brookville Lake? Yeah. Alex met Monty's hectic gaze in the mirror. Some people say the Brookville troll killed him. It's not a troll. It's the spaceman. Tanya drawled from the passenger seat. All right, whatever. Spaceman. Monty shook his head. Either way, that shit is creepy. This place makes me think of that, you know? Alex sighed. Monty, shit, I don't know. I don't believe in that kind of stuff. Only what's real. Monty tittered, a high-pitched, breathless sound. An unpleasant sound. You're probably right. Stuff like that probably ain't real. He giggled again. By the way, we're here. The dirt road abruptly widened into a broad gravel expanse ringed with trees. Alex could see discarded cinder blocks, an old battered microwave, and other detritus yellow in the Regal's headlights. They crunched along for another 30 feet or so, and a dirty gray trailer appeared, nestled against the woods at the far end of the gravel. A man was sitting on the ground, leaning against the back tire of the trailer, his legs stuck out in front of him. As Monty stopped the car, Alex sat up straight. All right, you guys. Let's do this just how we rehearsed, and you'll be back out on the street in 24 hours. He thought a second before adding, And don't forget, there's backup waiting out there in the woods, so nothing funny. Monty turned and looked Alex in the face. He was very close, and his grimy smell wafted into the back like a fog. Don't you worry about nothing, boss. We got you. He smiled, a far less crazy smile than Alex had seen from him, opened his door, and climbed out of the car. For the first time since this plan was hatched, Alex felt a tickle of doubt. It flitted and bounced around his gut like bats. He lamented his lack of a gun, but it was too late for that now. He flipped the lever on the side of the driver's seat and pushed it forward, climbing out the open door as Tanya got out on her side. The doors were slammed, and they walked through the gravel to the trailer. The man sitting on the ground popped to his feet the moment they were all out of the car. As they approached, he pounded on the dented side of the trailer and shouted, Sire! Hey man, we got customers! To Alex, Monty, and Tanya, he held out his hand. Hey, y'all just stay put and hold on a second, okay? Monty held his own hands up, arms bent at the elbows, to show he wasn't holding anything. Hey man, it's all good. We're cool. Just here to do a little business. The other man did not lower his arm or change his posture. His brows were drawn together with concern. He was short, with a thick black beard and close-set eyes. That's fine, but I said wait. The three of them stopped and stood where they were. There was no light on in the trailer, and with the headlights of the Regal turned off, it was nearly black there in the clearing. As Alex looked around the yard, his eyes played tricks on him. It seemed like shadows moved and danced against the deeper black of the woods, mocking him. His body hummed with electricity, and a bell started clanging over and over in his mind, tolling, Bad idea. Bad idea. Sergeant Howard had been right. This was foolish. Don't be such a bitch. His inner voice was harsh, commanding. You're an Indiana State Trooper, and these are just a bunch of brain-dead, shit-kicking, sister-fucking inbred meth heads. You are equipped to handle this situation. You've trained for it. You don't need a gun. You will see this operation carried through. You will walk out of here alive, and you will get your man. 
His nerves seemed to sing a little bit more quietly after his internal scolding, and he tried to get into character as they waited for something to happen. A moment later, the trailer door banged open beneath its cheap tin awning, and a flashlight clicked on, its beam trained on Alex's group. At the other end of the light was the vague impression of a tall, skinny person. A voice called out. Hey there, who we got out here, Ezard? The flashlight's beam swept the gravel clearing, shining in Alex's eyes and blinding him. Who the fuck is that out there? The bearded man called back from somewhere ahead of them and to the right. Bunch of tweakers. Say they're here to do business with you. Monty lifted his hands all the way in the air. Hey! Hey, Grayson, it's me. Monty Legault. You remember? The flashlight holder's voice came back doubtful. Gotta be honest with you, Monty. I'm afraid you ain't ringing too much of a bell for me. You called me Squirrely Sam. Oh, yeah. The flashlight beam was quickly aimed down at the ground, and Alex watched its bobbing progress while its owners strode towards them. Squirrely Sam and Long Tall Sally. You got old Sally with you? Yep. She's here. The man with the flashlight whistled appreciatively. Man, she had a mouth on her. I remember that. The bobbing circle of light reached their feet and the person controlling it stood before them. He was still bathed in shadow, but was illuminated enough for Alex to see that he was a long, skinny scarecrow of a man in a filthy tank top. He had long sideburns that stopped just short of being mutton chops, and a rockabilly pompadour swept back across the top of his head. In the dark, his eyes were just two black pools, his mouth a bottomless ravine. He brought the flashlight back up and shined it in Alex's face again. Who's this Jethro-looking motherfucker? I don't remember him. Oh, it's my nephew, cousin, Denny. He's riding out to the campground with us tonight. Is that so? The man seemed to be staring at Alex, but it was hard to tell. Yep. Alex did a very passable imitation of Monty and Tanya's white trash twang. We getting fucked up tonight, boy. The man just stood there, the silence gaining weight with each passing second. Alex began to sweat. Shit, he knows. He began thinking about the likelihood of survival if he just cut and ran for the woods. When the man dropped the flashlight to his side and stuck out his hand to be shaken. Isaiah Grayson, goddamn nice to meet you. Alex took the meth dealer's hand and gave it a shake. Grayson turned and started back towards the trailer. Y'all come on in and we'll get you good and set. You can get on with your partying. They followed him up to the trailer. Ezard had gone in ahead of them and switched on a light, and now stood leaning in the doorway. Alex could see one arm of a ratty brown couch and a long, out-of-season Christmas tree beyond a plywood partition. A shadow moved, just on the other side of the couch, just out of Alex's field of vision. Someone else was in there. Alex's heart began to beat faster, and every instinct that he'd developed over 13 years in law enforcement cried out against going through that door. But it was too late to back out now. Monty and Tanya had caught up to Grayson a few yards ahead of him, and the three of them were muttering and chuckling. Tanya climbed the steps to the door and patted Ezard's sweat-stained paunch. He smiled moving aside for her, and she climbed past him and out of sight. Monty followed close behind and bumped fists with Ezard. Grayson stopped at the door and waited. The drug dealer's mouth stretched into a toothy grin as Alex climbed past him up the steps. Come on in, Alex. We're going to get you set up real nice. Alex cleared his throat. 
The nagging fear that this had all somehow gone terribly awry made it hard for him to reproduce his earlier twang. Uh, yeah, thanks. He passed through into the doorway and then stopped cold. Alex. He'd called him Alex. The panic that had been brewing over the last few minutes finally broke, and Alex spun around to leap from the trailer. Grayson was already there, filling the doorway and smiling. What's wrong, Alex? I mean, Denny. Where you going, little guy? Fuck you! You're under arrest! Alex took a swing at Grayson, his fist careening at the other man's face. Instead of striking hard flesh, however, when his fist connected with Grayson's jaw, it was like punching into a moldy, long-forgotten cake. Grayson's face caved in with a sickening give. Spongy dumplings of flesh, bone, and teeth flew like brown and red confetti, and more dripped from Alex's curled fingers and wrist. He yanked his arm back with a disgusting squelch as the lower half of Grayson's face collapsed in on itself. Alex's mouth dropped open and his eyes went wide. Grayson tried to smile with what was left of his mouth, a twitching, cavernous ruin, and dropped Alex an obscene wink. Alex jerked his head away, turning to look into the tiny hallway to his left and saw Monty and Tanya. Before entering the trailer, they had been dirty and disheveled with soiled clothes and sallow skin, but they had also clearly been living, breathing human beings. Now, standing hunched in the shadows, two corpses wearing Tanya and Monty's clothes stared back at him from eye sockets picked clean by grave scavengers. Grayish-green flesh, mottled with tiny bits of clinging fungus, hung in thick ribbons from their skulls. Their lips rotted away to reveal denuded jaws. Blowflies circled their heads like black, buzzing halos, occasionally landing to crawl through the dry straw of their hair. They were still lively enough, though, that Alex could hear Monty's finger bones clattering together as he continued to jitter and jive, and Tanya's endless humming vibrating through her exposed trachea. As he tried to make sense of the nightmares surrounding him, Alex heard a shuffling sound from the living room area behind him, and he turned. When he saw what was standing there, he began to scream. He couldn't understand exactly what his eyes were trying to tell him. His head began to ache with the effort of assigning a shape to the tall, dark being that shambled across the filthy floor toward him. Human, it wasn't. That one was easy to toss out. Other things suggested themselves, though, in a gauzy, shifting way where for a second it was almost an insect, but not an insect at all. Points of light would blossom in colors never seen by any sane person, like eyes opening within what was maybe its head, and then they would close, and mouths would appear with moving, slathering tongues and dripping teeth. Was it a dog with an ape's body? Was it an inside-out octopus? Did it have feathers? Or was it made of fecal matter? Yes and no. All of this and none of it. Alex could no longer hear the blistering screams that tore from his own throat. But it seemed that there was no bottom to the well from which they were drawn. He wished for the mercy of death or madness, but his mind clung to rationality with a heartbreaking tenacity. It came closer, reaching for him. 
Some part of it, a darkly glowing tendril, touched him with a loathsome, groping sensation that was nearly a caress, and Alex could sense its hunger, its eagerness to have him, to consume him. With a miserable understanding, Alex collapsed to the floor, his body unable to stand any longer beneath the weight of his terror. Behind him, the Grayson thing dripped laughter from the depths of its cavernous face and shut the trailer door. Back at the dispatch room of the Dearborn County Sheriff's Department, Officer Chris Lucky Ferguson and Sergeant Donald Howard listened to Alex's terror-soaked shrieks. They heard the sounds of his struggle, heard the dark laughter of his captors. Whatever was happening had to be very bad to reduce a man like Alex to such a shrill frenzy. No! They heard him cry. Undo these straps! Undo them right now, goddammit! Oh, God, do you see that? What is it? What the fuck is it? He moaned, his voice small and tiny in the headphones. Howard dropped his and ran from the office, shouting for someone to get the fucking helicopter up. Lucky kept listening, not wanting to hear any more, but unable to put his headset aside. Keep that away, please! I'll do anything. You can kill me, please. I'll... What are you doing with that? Oh my fucking God, that hurts! There was the sound of garbled laughter and someone singing. A woman. The song seemed vaguely familiar to Lucky. Some song from the 60s. Something spooky. There was more laughter and then Alex's voice again. Get her out of me! Then a long, tremulous howl of absolute soul-shattering pain and despair. The sound of sanity breaking free and fleeing in horror. Alex seemed to be crying and laughing all at the same time. And then came the last words anyone would ever hear him speak. No, no, I don't want it. I do not want that. Wait, what? Oh, dear Jesus. How, how many fucking legs does she have? Then there was a horrible buzzing feedback and the connection went dead. Ice cold tears spilled down Lucky's cheeks as he threw his headphones down onto the table and vomited into the wastebasket beside his chair. Six weeks later, two men and a woman are brought into the Bloomington PD on suspicion of trying to sell meth on the Indiana University campus. They're kept in separate holding cells, but are brought together into an interrogation room by a vice detective named Scott. He's heard whispers of a traveling meth operation selling out of a beat-up trailer, and for some reason, he's got a feeling about these three. One of the men has dry, dirty, shaggy blonde hair. He twitches and giggles. The second man is clean-shaven with short, sandy hair. He has a large earring in one ear. Scott's not sure but he feels like he's seen the man before. Probably picked up dozens of times for drug charges, but that doesn't seem to be where he's familiar from. No matter. The woman is skinny, all legs and long bleached hair. Her mouth is closed, and she doesn't speak as Scott begins to ask them questions about a man named Grayson. But she does keep humming something under her breath. The tune is as vaguely familiar as the face of the second man. It finally comes to him as they're promising to take him to the man he's looking for. 
the man who killed the decorated state cop before disappearing into the night, and who is wanted by every law enforcement division in the country. The song is Time of the Season by the Zombies. He loves that song. He has a good feeling about this bust. A very good feeling, indeed. I hope you enjoyed Trailer Trash, written by R.K. Combrink and performed by Jonathan West, myself Steve Taylor, Eric Peabody, Nick Goroff, Rissa Montanez, and Kevin Barberi. Tonight's tale was brought to us by our friends over at Velox Books. Well, friends, our weekly descent into the depths has just about come to a close. But before we go, I'd like to take a moment to thank you for joining us for tonight and remind you to take a moment to stop by our iTunes page and leave Chilling Tales for Dark Nights a five-star review and a kind word. And follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram if you haven't already. And of course, subscribe to us on YouTube, where you can find an archive of our work going back to 2012. And consider signing up as a patron at our website, ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com, to show your support and get all of our content ad-free. I'm your host of the evening, Steve Taylor, and it's been a pleasure. Tune in again next week when we once again turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Sweet dreams, listener. Sweet dreams. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.